morning, everyone. Ooh, that's loud. <laughs> I think we have everyone in place now. <coughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, I would now like to reconvene this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board. Uh, can I have a board member certify closed session, please? Madam Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, mm -hmm. discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Hundley. Dollar when you're ready. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. <clears throat> Aye. And can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hosang. Ms. Aller. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. And I will ask Mr. Riffle, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure. Stand Please if you're able. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> All right, then we will move right along to superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. WJCC values the expertise of educators from various backgrounds and pathways who bring real life experience to the classroom. If you have considered a career in teaching, we really want to meet with you. Join us and spread the word on Thursday, April 11th at 5 p.m. at James Player Middle School you can come and learn about multiple options for earning teaching credentials to fit every timeline and budget. WJCC Schools Tuition Assistance Program, including full reimbursement for some of the programs we offer. Ways prospective teachers can be hired to teach while they still, while they earn their, their teaching credentials. Also, this is the last chance for incoming kindergarten families to register for the Family Academy webinar, Kindergarten Kickoff, Your Guide to a Great Start. During the webinar, participants will receive information about the kindergarten registration process, including eligibility criteria, health and transportation information, and a sneak peek of what to expect at the Kindergarten Registration Family Fest in April. Visit wjccschools.org to register for tomorrow's webinar. Thank you, Madam Chair. This concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Heron. And now we're moving on to the school spotlight. <coughs> Tonight we are highlighting school. Oh, I'm sorry. Pause that. I forgot the uh, board member reports. Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to um, recognize SEAC, um, our Special Education Advisory Committee, um, for all of their hard work in organizing and hosting the Family Fun Day that occurred on Saturday um, to celebrate all families and to bring awareness to disability awareness and advocacy this month. Um, so, and I also want to encourage um, everybody out there, um, even if you're, you're not necessarily a, a family with a child that has um, special education needs, that we all should be involved in advocating for um, special education and so the next meeting is uh, Thursday uh, April 11th at 630 um, and then there's one more meeting for the year on May 9th so hope to see you there thank you Ms. Chen and Mrs. Donner did you have a report yes uh, Mrs. Ortigo and I had the school liaison meeting and that is meeting between us uh, the so representing the school board the uh, board of supervisors two members and two members from city council uh, during that meeting, we talked about the budget and our thought process around it. Uh, we also use those meetings as an opportunity to hear what some of their questions and concerns are and to just build relationships uh, with the localities. Uh, that was then followed by our joint meeting, which was last Friday. That's my report. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Anyone else? 
Okay, now we will move on to our school spotlight, and tonight we are highlighting Laurel Lane Elementary School. <laughs> I walk up music tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron, good evening. It is my pleasure to share with you about Josh's Kindness Squad at Laurel Lane Elementary School. In 2022, Jennifer Miller, a member of our staff, saw the many ways that acts of kindness were promoted and carried out throughout the school community. She inquired about formalizing the concept to recognize the kind acts occurring. Our student council association officers and representatives were also talking about these ideas with the school sponsors. One of the student council officers, Joshua Peck, was steadfast in seeking ways to perform those kind acts and service projects. He'd helped his third grade teacher along with classmates with the creation of and the upkeep of a memorial garden for one of our beloved teachers who had passed away unexpectedly. He came to the office daily seeking ways to help with any task or needs. He also would check in with our administrative team, ensuring we were taking care of business with activities and initiatives. We began to coin him our third administrator. Unexpectedly, we lost Josh on December 30th, 2022. Trying to navigate this loss was and remains a process for all of us. With his family's permission, we had greater direction about how we wanted to remember and celebrate a young man's life who exemplified kindness, service, and making a positive difference for others. In January 2023, we named the Acts of Kindness group Josh's Kindness Squad. I'm proud for you all to see and learn about how our Kindness Club works. Um, in the video that's coming up. At the end of last month, the House of Delegates honored Joshua by approving and sharing a resolution presented to his family. We will do something locally at a later time, but it is our hope that his family knows through this tremendous loss, the incredible impact Josh has had in our school community and beyond. Josh's mom, who is amazing and a member of our staff, Christina, is here this evening. Again, daily, we hope our penguins, the adults, and children are learning about the importance and power of kindness, even with a smile, because kindness costs nothing. So without further ado, I hope that you all will be able to take a look at this video and see about how we are promoting care, engagement, and a sense of belonging for each person that enters our campus. Thank you. When we're teaching our kids about the Penguin Way, when we're teaching them about being polite, positive, prepared, and productive, all of that encompasses kindness. When you can put a smile on someone's face, when you can make someone feel better, and it doesn't have to cost a thing, it can be as easy as a smile. I make a list in the beginning of the year with a kindness challenge for each week, so as many classes can participate as possible. We've done some wonderful things. The Students really enjoy writing messages of thanks to our staff. It makes me feel very good about myself because then that creates kindness for everybody else and that once I pass kindness on to that person, I'll pass it on to more people and hopefully that makes, a, uh, that makes our school better. I feel the kids taking pride in the things that they do as they make other people feel good. Across the board, every class that I've seen do this has really enjoyed themselves. Oftentimes we don't give our kids chances to give back or to show kindness and um, having this chance in school is great. Kindness can go a long way and it can make somebody's day very easily and I hope it does because kindness is something that you should give out without expecting to receive back but still expect the other person to be happy because of it. We have had buddy classes go in and read with one another, and it's such a great feeling for the older kids to be able to come in and feel like they're helping um, the younger kids with their learning, and it just, it is really building the community here at Laurel Lane. They bombarded one of the cores um, with kind, sticky notes, just with like sweet, sweet messages and these little dinosaurs everywhere. Some of the kids still have the little sticky notes that you are loved or you matter. We want that type of joy. We want that type of happiness. The saying, tis better to give than receive. There's something about being able to give and expecting nothing in return. Um, that is a really cool 
thing. I mean, it's just teaching good citizenship. I've enjoyed seeing the kids excited about making one another happy and excited. Oh, it makes me feel absolutely incredible because I just love seeing people having smiles on their faces. It just makes my, my heart warm and happy. Thank you, Dr. Swan. Thank you for sharing that very inspiring story. And uh, <clears throat> as a mom, I just want to extend my condolences to Josh's mom and thank her for the amazing gifts she gave the world that still lives on. And now I will gladly turn it over to the vice chair. Uh, um, I'll, I'll step Sorry. in and do some recognition. Yep. Yes, we have a special recognition this evening, and so I will turn it over to our vice chair, Mrs. Donna. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman. Though this award is not a surprise, the school board would like to honor Dr. Heron, who late last month was named Region 2 Superintendent of the Year by the Virginia Association of School Superintendents. Is, not only is Dr. Heron a student-centered leader, she cares deeply about the WJCC school's team and community. She is a fierce advocate for staff and education and the education profession, working to build teacher form and support employee form during her tenure to ensure direct lines of communication with staff. Programs developed or expanded under her leadership, such as mentoring and professional learning for novice and veteran educators, the exceptional games to celebrate the abilities of all, and investing in technology resources, demonstrate her commitment to continuous improvement and dedication to elevating the working and learning environment at WJCC schools. Dr. Heron is now under consideration for Virginia Superintendent of the Year. We congratulate her on this accomplishment, wish her well in the next step, and thank her for her hard work and commitment. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. This concludes recognitions for this evening. If I could just make a quick comment, Madam Chair, you know, no leader is ever recognized for what they do. It's for what everybody does within the system. And so any recognition that we have, and especially this one, is for everyone. It's for the board, it's for senior staff, it's for every teacher in the room tonight, every person in ops, because ultimately it takes a whole team, and I'm proud to have an amazing team. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. And we're Glad you're our superintendent. And now we will um, move on to public comments. And again, I will turn it over to Mrs. Donner. It is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the board. Those citizens desiring to speak have submitted speaker cards to the clerk prior to the start of tonight's meeting. These speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their names for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. It is, the board's, it is the board's interest and desire that all comments are heard and respected. Hence, the citizens are asked to not engage in applauding, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstrations during the presentations. Personnel matters are not considered in public meetings, therefore the board requests that all speakers refrain from making reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. Though the board does not respond to your comments, your comments are heard and appreciated. Each speaker is allocated two minutes to make their presentation and the board asks that you respect this time limitation. Also, please be reminded that no time may be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Madam Chair, and my directions are concluded. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Our first speaker is Leanne Liebler. Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to discuss um, my concerns about the attendance policy that's been implemented um, this year based on how it affects um, our children who are participating in travel sports um, and 
how that reflects on their excused or unexcused absences of school. Um, I have a letter written, my daughter um, swims, and I have a letter from her coach, and so I had asked her to um, help us out here because we've been called for an attendance meeting because we have had to have some absences due to some swim meets. And um, so um, I'd like to read that now. Um, this is a letter from our head coach, Morgan Cordell of 757 Swim. It says, to whom it may concern, I hope this letter finds you well. My name is Morgan Cordell, head coach and CEO of 757 Swim. I'm writing to express my concerns regarding the current attendance policy within the WJCC school system. While I appreciate the school system's dedication to creating an environment that fosters academic excellence and personal growth, I believe that the current policy falls short in supporting students who participate in sports outside of the school sanctioned programs. It is important to acknowledge that college recruitment often extends beyond high school sports and many student athletes find themselves excelling in club sports and travel competitions. These students are not only achieving success in their chosen sports, but also demonstrating outstanding academic performance and involvement in various extracurricular activities. However, the current attendance policy fails to recognize and accommodate the unique demands placed on these students. One significant disparity arises from the fact that student athletes participating in school sports are granted excused absences to attend competitions. On the other hand, their counterparts engaged in club sports, which may not even be offered through a school, are not afforded the same. That's, that's that the time limit, Ms. Oh, Ms. Liebler. Okay. You can, if you have a written um, statement, you can give it to the clerk okay. and it will be entered in. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Allison Sickler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Allison Sigler. I'm an active duty military spouse here in Williamsburg, Virginia. I have three teenagers in WJCC schools. In December, I was required to attend an attendance meeting for my daughter who's a freshman at Jamestown High School for having five unexcused absences, two of which were for travel sports. She's a competitive equestrian and competes at the state level in Virginia. One was um, when my husband returned from deployment last September. That was also listed as unexcused, and the other two were for a family trip in December. Um, I have in my hands here deployment orders for my husband once again, who leaves next week. He's an emergency medicine physician with the United States Army stationed at Fort Eustis, Virginia. He deploys next week. This deployment has been highly publicized since President Biden announced it in his presidential address a couple of weeks ago. His brigade is the 7th Transportation Brigade at Fort Eustis, and they have been tasked with building the floating causeway um, to Gaza to deliver humanitarian aid. This is a three to six month mission. According to your current policy, I can't take my children out of school to spend time with him before he deploys, or it will be deemed an unexcused absence. Virginia has 77,000 military children. We are in the top five every year. Uh, we have more military children than Georgia and North Carolina, and they both have written into their state and district levels that military dependents can have up to five, un five excused absences on the back or front end of a deployment, of a military deployment. This is the first district I've ever lived in that doesn't have a policy to support military dependents in this way. I would like to respectfully request that this district and the school board consider adopting such a policy. I understand that this may need to go to the state level, and I'm happy to advocate at the state level for that. I really appreciate your time. Um, I've also brought some uh, documentation of what other districts and states and how they've outlined it, if I could give that to someone. Please give that to our clerk, Ms. Ziegler, and thank you for your family service. Our next speaker is Rachel Drozlowski. My name is Rachel Drozdowski, and I am the parent of a freshman at Jamestown High School. 
Um, I would like to start off just by acknowledging the work of the board, our superintendent, Principal Townsend, the teachers, the administrators. We have such a great school, such a great district, and our community is really, really fortunate. I got a little bit teary from Alice's speech. I apologize. Um, the reason that we're all here tonight is to talk about the concerns we have about the attendance policy. Um, my daughter plays sports in national competitions. She also maintains a 4.0 GPA at Jamestown, and that takes a lot of work. She had a severe allergic reaction this semester, which caused her to miss some school um, while she was re recovering, and um, she has more appointments coming up. With her travel for sports coming up, she's going to be butting up against these attendance policies as well, as well and she could be facing failure um, in classes where she has a 4.0. We communicate with the school. I, I let them know what's happening. She communicates with their teachers. And it's just that she works so hard. And her and other students now are potentially subject to disciplinary measures if they're missing school to compete in events or um, other important, important events in their life. Um, I understand that there's regulations from the Commonwealth, and those are being in implemented across the state. But we're hopeful that the one-size-fits-all approach that's being taken with the students and absences in the district can be reconsidered. So it takes into account the students' performance, how they're doing in school, and whether or not the, the travel is really for a justified reason versus you know staying home to play video games or, or maybe something else that's not bettering their future or um, um, furthering family connections. Um, thank you for your time, and especially thank you all for, for you do for our kids. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Roslowski. Our next speaker is Andrew Kaysen. Hello. Good evening. I'm very happy to report that I am speaking on behalf of 800 employees that have now signed authorization cards electing WJCEA as their employee representative. Teachers have already said with a collective voice that we need collective bargaining. And we have seen more bus drivers and teachers assistants sign cards. They too are well on their way to their majorities. What WJCEA has been able to accomplish is a remarkable feat of organizing and education. Members are organized and ready to bargain. We have our list of issues. We've gone through hours of venting and conversation. And we are ready to bargain in good faith and for the common good. You can't afford to ignore our requests. Many of us are quitting mid-year, and the division struggles to fill vacancies with qualified teachers. Please, act soon. Form a joint committee with WJCA and all other stakeholders. We, we educators, we don't shy away from challenges, and I sure don't teach uh, students to shy away from challenges either. We should go about changing the status quo so that we can save our profession and make this a truly premier school district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaysen. Uh, the next speaker is Jessica Anderson. Good evening, school board and uh, Dr. Herring. My name is Jessica Anderson. I am both a WJCC employee as well as a WJC school parent. Um, I'm here this evening to discuss a couple points. Um, first. Like the previous speaker, I'd ask the school board to join a form a joint committee with WJCEA to ensure we have the ability to collective bargain and have a seat at the table. Um, I think um, there's a real concern around us not having a voice within things that um, affect our career path and ability to be the best we can for our students and our families. Um, I would also ask you to work with the other local government entities to ensure that we get an additional 5% pay raise in the upcoming school year. Um, and make us a little more competitive as compared to our neighboring districts. Uh, in the last two weeks, I've seen at least four WJCC employees leaving the division, um, two immediately and two that are going to end their term at the end of the school year. Um, two of those individuals left to a neighboring district for better economic um, stability, um, and one of them left the state for a better financial opportunity. And this is a trend that we're seeing, and we really don't have um, the ability to lose two of which of these people have more than 30 years of experience in WJCC. That is expertise that is now walking out of the door. Um, we can't afford to continue to lose teachers and educators and staff at this rate and be successful as a division. 
So I really hope that you look to that um, and think on that as we're talking about pay increases, as we're talking about collective bargaining. Um, I also want to address something as a parent of someone who's at LHS, who um, my children have ran for LHS for over six years collectively, and the track is abysmal. Um, I know that it was on the schedule a while back. It feels like it's kind of fallen at the wayside. There is little growth coming through it. Lanes one, two, and three are patched down to literally asphalt. Um, the other school divisions, um, and we have a very competitive team, both cross country and track, and we do not have a actual place to run. Um, and I finally want to say I recognize the shortfalls that you deal with with the state when it comes to attendance, and I just want to say I know you all are doing your best. So, um, anyways, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Our next, spe our next speaker is Kara McLean. We have quite a few, so after her will be Marge Sar Sardi. Marco, I'm sorry, Marco, but <laughs> trying to read handwriting. <laughs> I was like, oh, his wife is here. I'm sorry. It's up to the clerk. Yeah. The yeah. clerk. Good evening. Um, I'm concerned about the codes um, and guidelines of Virginia and the Williamsburg, uh, J the WJCC policies not being followed for the abstinence-based family life education class. The code of Virginia says that a complete copy of all printed material and the audio and visual material must be available to parents for in-person review upon request and be kept in the school library or office during school hours before and during the school year. When I went to my um, son's school on 3 7 2024, um, I was um, asked to see the curriculum, and the binder um, had a letter on the front from uh, 41723, which stated, principals, we are providing each school with a binder of the uh, family life curriculum relevant to the school's grade span. But when I opened the, the um, binder, there was um, material for sixth grade and 10th grade, and it was from the year 1990. So yesterday, I went to one of the middle schools in town, um, and they had the same the same cover letter for 1723 and the same sixth grade and tenth grade material they did have a little instead of a big binder they had a tiny um, well manila uh, folder with sixth seventh and eighth grade and I know that's not all the material for because I've looked at the material so often and so they d did not have the complete material either and there was no c computer set up so that the audio and visual material could be looked at um, online and the principals did not uh, at either school and the principals did not know that they were supposed to be having this at either of those schools and um, they also did not know that under the cover letter was material that was not um, current. Everyone I talked to have had great difficulty in looking at the material even though it is available online on the WJCC website and they have a lot have not even known that it was there to look through. Another concern is section 8 of the uh, Board of Education guidelines which says a plan for teaching sensitive content in gender separated classes shall be announced publicly but students in 6th through um, high school are taught gender combined and parents have not known this and have been horrified and thank you, Mrs. Um, thank you for hearing me thank you up next is Marco Sardi and following him will be Summer Kirkpatrick good evening madam chair members of the board and dr. Heron my name is Marco Sardi and I'm the president of WJCEA and a teacher here at James Blair in previous discussions, there was debate over how much of a raise we could provide staff within a reasonable increase to our request to the funding partners. The 3% originally designated in Dr. Heron's budget draft was based on a negligible increase, assuming from the state to support our SQ staff. The difference between what was being provided and what we were asking for at that time was about 2%. We now know that state funding supports an increase of 3% to SOQ staff. I would request the same consideration be taken for an increase of about 2% from there to fill our needs. These are not wants. Hampton Schools released an increase of about 4.8% to their educators for the coming year. 
So a 5% increase would encourage our staff to be uh, remaining for next year and would provide a means of filling currently vacant positions like bus drivers and therapists. I hope you've received the results of the survey done by WJCEA to help provide additional insight into the values and needs of your employees. I encourage you to read their honest feedback and to find the value in requesting those needs from those who try their best to provide for our students their very best every day. As I'm sure you're all aware, the release of the feasibility study has presented an opportunity to reflect on how we can support our students in a collaborative system. And that will take all of us, whether it is employees, administrators, community members, or local governing bodies. I feel strongly that we have an opportunity to think of ways to be bold in supporting educators and to find new ways to meet the needs of our joint community. It is now more than ever that we must come together and work more clearly as a team between educators and administration to find these solutions in retaining good staff and exploring solutions. A joint committee between administrative team, the school board, and WJCEA will facilitate these conversations and can be another tool to forming a better community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sardi. Summer Kirkpatrick is our next speaker, followed by Lindsay Taylor. Hello, my name is Summer Kirkpatrick, and I'm the mother of a first grader at Matthew Whaley Elementary. In January, my child struggled to go to school in the morning. <clears throat> he told me that he felt sick and he didn't want to go to school. Mom, don't make me go to school. Um, in February, I found out that my child's class had been evacuated multiple times. Um, I found this out because a Another child told their parent, and that parent shared it with me. Knowing this, I asked him, do you feel safe at school? No, I don't. Um, in March, my child's first grade teacher resigned. He now has a long-term substitute for the rest of the school year. A study was done in California and Oregon in 2020 uh, following the effects of extreme behavior on kindergarten classes. The study found that 8% of schools contacted parents to let them know, um, whereas 70% of parents contacted the schools to voice concern. I believe this study highlights the communication discrepancy I experienced at Matthew Whaley. I found out about the evacuations from another parent who heard it from their child. I do not believe that first graders are reliable communicators. As a parent, I would like better communication from my child's school when he's exposed to violent behavior so that I can help him process his trauma. I can't help my child if I don't know what he is experiencing. <clears throat> I urge the school district to examine its policies regarding crisis communications, specifically repeated incidents that result in classroom evacuations. Please provide guidelines for teachers and staff on effective communication following disruptive incidents. I do believe that Matthew Whaley has worked hard to keep my child safe and that he is at a safe school. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kirkpatrick. Our next speaker is Lindsay Taylor and she will be followed by Rachel Moore. Hello. I am the Vice President of WJCEA and I work at James River Elementary School. First, I would like to ask that you create a joint committee, school board representatives and WJCEA representatives, so we can create a collective bargaining agreement together. Our goals are transparency and to work together to come up with something that works for everyone. In fact, some of what we want to do is to codify some of the wonderful things the board and Dr. Heron are already doing for us, so let's get that in writing. Second, I want to thank you for advocating for a salary increase above the originally asked for 3%. I love my job and I love my kids, but it's becoming or has become financially irresponsible for me to continue teaching. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from William & Mary, which I'm still paying for, and 10 years of teaching experience. And I'm still making less than my college classmates starting salaries nearly 20 years ago. I know you can't compete with the private sector, due mostly to systematic problems that we can't fix here today. And I hope that that soon will change. But until then, be bold. Be bolder than our neighbors. 
I currently make $57,577. In Newport News, Hampton, York, and Charles City, I would be making more than $60,000. If you can't stay competitive with our surrounding divisions, then you're asking every one of your employees to make a sacrifice to stay in this community that we love. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. The next speaker, speaker is Rachel Moore, followed by Aylin Parm. Good evening, Madam Chair, Dr. Heron, and members of the board. My name is Rachel Moore. This is my 18th year teaching in WJCC, and I have loved almost every moment. Um, and I'm also the parent of a current WJCC student, as well as uh, one who has graduated and one who received a GED through our school system. So I have um, a variety of perspectives. I'm here this evening because I truly believe that we share a common mission and a common commitment to providing our students and our children a quality education in these especially challenging times. To this end, we request the school board to form a joint committee with WJCEA to draft a collective bargaining resolution. This partnership will positively contribute to retention of quality educators to serve our students. It's crucial, as you've heard from others, that our district remain competitive by offering teachers wages that fairly compensate them for the hours required by their contract and also as an acknowledgement for the many, many, many hours we all put in beyond our contract hours because we care about our students, we care about supporting them, ensuring their wellness and success. So I thank you very much for all that you do. We appreciate your time and commitment. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Aylin Parm, followed by Lori Cardina. Good evening, Madam Chair, esteemed members of the board, and Dr. Heron. My name is Alyn Parm. I am a WJCEA member and a social studies teacher at Jamestown. I am here today to ask you to support um, an ad hoc committee with WJCEA to discuss and develop a joint resolution for collective bargaining. Furthermore, I would like to encourage the board in their conversations regarding the budget that includes staff salary, pay adjustments, and health insurance premiums. I thank you in encouraging the conversation on a 5% raise. As like my colleagues here in WJCC, you know, I too have two degrees um, from two different institutions and currently work a second job to maintain living where I am and pay my bills. And in our division, we will need to continue to work hard to keep our current teachers, our veteran teachers like myself, and bring in more teachers as well. Thank you for your time and your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Parm. And uh, our next speaker is Lori Cardina. Hi, good, good, good evening. My name is Lori Cardenas, and I am a speech language pathologist. I've been um, practicing for the last 28 years in the school system, and I've been working here um, in Williamsburg. I've lived in Williamsburg for the last 19 years, and um, working for WJCC for the last 17 years. So I love Williamsburg James City County Schools and I love, I love what we do. And I, um, right now for the last 14 years, I've been a preschool therapist, working with all of the Bright Beginning students and really helping our really needy two to five year olds try to make a better start. So I really appreciate that you're here. I appreciate all you try to do for our students and our staff. And I am just asking you to please consider forming a joint committee so we can form together as a unit and so we can try to like help the school board, help the staff, help the superintendent. So when we go and request things from the board of supervisors, we can get more backing and we can get the parents. There's lots of parents that support us. So we can really try to save education in America because we all are educators, we love our students, we love educating them, and we are just really failing in many ways. 
and we don't want to do that and we know um, of the problems that we are having so the major thing that we have is the lack of manpower and the lack of therapists and being able to keep people on staff so that always go back unfortunately to money but there's also other things we can do too that don't cost money like work environment or e-commute days there's all kinds of things and we all have such great ideas like together we can really make a difference and try to really help um, education especially in Williamsburg Jane City County but in America this is a passionate plea from all of us thank you Ms. Cardino thank you that concludes our speakers speaker cards for the evening thank you Mrs. Donner thank you to all of our speakers who came out tonight we we don't as you know respond to each of you but we do with you and we appreciate your time and, and your comments we will now move on to uh, the consent agenda it is a little lengthy so bear with me as I read through these items <coughs> we are looking at item 7.01 approval of financial report and monthly bills and payroll February 2024 7.02 approval of minutes from 20, 20, uh, sorry, February 20th, 24 meeting, 7.03, approval of minutes from March 5th, 24 meeting, 7.04, approval of resolution R924, month of the military child, 7.05, approval of resolution R1024, school library month, 7.6, approval of resolution R1124, public school volunteer week, 7.07 .07, approval of resolution R1224 VSBA 2024 business honor roll 7.08 approval of revisions to policy EBB threat assessment team 7.09 approval of revisions to policy EEBA authorized use of vehicles 7.10 approval of revisions to policy GA personnel policy goals 7.11 approval of retirement of policy GBBD non instructional use of social media 7.12 <coughs> approval of revisions to policy GCPA reduction in workforce item 7.13 approval of creation of policy GBG staff participation in political activities 7.14 approval of res revisions to policy KHE political activity Last but not least, 7.15, approval of revisions to policy KNA, violent sex offenders on school property. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Madam Chair, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Mr. Jose. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Henley. Ms. Aller, when you're ready. Mr. Jose. Aye. Mrs. Henley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. All right. Moving on to our individual action items. Item 8.01, approval of personnel actions. Can I have a motion? I move to approve personnel actions as presented. Thank you, Mrs. Chen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Henley. Ms. Aller. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. We will move on to 8.02, approval of fiscal year 2025 budget. And before I ask for a motion, I'm going to ask Dr. Heron to give us a brief update on some numbers that have um, come in since our last meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. This evening, Ms. Ewing is going to present some slides uh, following the board conversation at the last meeting. Um, as of yet, we don't have a calc tool to give you an exact number of monies that we're going to receive uh, from the state, but uh, she will also speak to that. Thank you, Ms. Ewing. I need to read my disclosure statement first. As a member of the school board of Williamsburg, Jane City County, I acknowledge that I ha may have an interest in the F Y 25 school budget because my husband is an employee of the WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly objectively and in the public interest. Thank you, 
Thank you, Dr. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. On February 20th, we presented the superintendent's proposed budget, and during discussions at the March 5th work session, there was a desire of the board to make some modifications to that proposal. This evening, I will walk through those proposed modifications prior to the board voting on the budget. Superintendent's proposed budget totaled $179,915,000, and the proposed modifications that the board is considering include changing the salary increase from an average 3% to an average 4.5% for all staff at a cost of $1.8 million, increasing the division's health contribution by setting the rates based on the Key Advantage 500 plan for a cost of $600,000, and lastly, changing the bilingual language specialist from a half-time to full-time at a cost of $45,000. This would bring the board's operating budget total to $182,360,000. Last month, we shared this chart that shows a comparison of current year employee rates for health insurance as compared to estimated rates for next year, with the estimated rates being based on the Quintera Health Plan, which has an increased cost of 3.4%, and that increase is then shared with employees on a 70% WJPP, 30% employee split. This is a sampling of the rate sheet, and as an example, currently an employee with the Key Advantage 500 plan with comprehensive dental pays $570 per month. Under this rate plan, the estimated cost next year would be $725 for a monthly increase of $155. One of the modifications the board is considering this evening is to base the division's health care rate on the increase in the Key Advantage 500 plan, which has been our practice in past years. This table shows a comparison of current year employee rates for health insurance as compared to estimated rates for next year. The estimated rates are based on the Key Advantage 500 plan, which has an increased cost of 9%, and that increase is then shared with the employees on a 70% WJPP, 30% employee split. Under this scenario, an employee currently on the Key Advantage 500 comprehensive plan with family coverage would pay an estimated $632 per month or an increase of $62 over the current year. As you can see, since the Sentara increase is 3.4%, if an employee is currently on the Sentara plan and remains in that plan, then their monthly cost would go down based on these estimated rates. Taking this a step further, on this slide are a couple of examples of what the potential 4.5% salary increase would look like alongside a proposed annual increase in healthcare cost in our Sentara HMO plan, as well as our Key Advantage $250 deductible plan again with a 70-30 split based on the Key Advantage 500 plan premium increase. We have included two teacher examples, one at the beginning of the master's pay scale and one at the midpoint of the master's pay scale. We also have included two examples from a support grade six employee, one at the beginning of the scale and one at the midpoint of the pay scale. This is a best case and worst case scenario based on health care choice with the dark blue line representing an employee with the Sentara HMO and employee only coverage, and the turquoise colored line representing an employee with the Key Advantage 250 plan with family coverage, our most expensive option. As an example, on the far left of the slide is a step zero teacher, and the range when comparing a salary raise with the increased healthcare cost is between $1,408 and $2,764. Healthcare is an employee choice, and the division offers several options for our employees to choose from. As we shared last month, in an effort to help our employees better understand their various health plan options, we intend to offer a division-wide health fair and additional educational opportunities. We will ensure all employees have the opportunity to participate so they can select the plan that best suits their healthcare needs. 
This slide shows what the modifications to the superintendent's proposed budget would mean in regards to a funding request of our localities. Contained within the superintendent's proposed budget was a request for just under $8.1 million. And with the proposed modifications that the board is considering this evening, the revised amount would be $10.5 million. As we shared at last week's joint meeting with our funding partners, based on a preliminary estimate provided by the state for the General Assembly's budget, we may see an increase in state funding of approximately $4 million, which would mean an adjusted local funding request of $6.5 million. We expect to have the budget calc tool by Monday, um, so we would ask that the board authorize Dr. Heron to reduce the request of the localities by that increased amount of state funding before we transmit the budget request to the localities next week. And this slide shows the total of all funds, including operating grants, state operated programs, and child nutrition services funds, which amounts to a total of $199,646,000 for fiscal year 2025, with the proposed modifications presented this evening. And that is all the information that I have to share. If there are any questions? Mr. Russell? Could you just tell us how much of a percentage? We are asking, for like, it's like, a, is it a 7.8% on top of our, you know, I mean, we talked about this in our previous meeting. Um, is it 7.8 on top of the operating <coughs> budget? For the locality Additional? Request? Yeah, yeah. I have to go get my paper. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you in the spot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a calculator up here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we I think circle Jen back to that, maybe. <coughs> can. Yeah, I, I think it's just like I'm trying to point out that we are doing a substantial amount um, what for from our current budget and that's you know kind of why we're kind of getting to this point and when we're going to approve this budget um, I, I just think it's important to kind of share that information with the public because it is it is a lot more than typical years we do so the typical year is about 2.5 million uh, 2.5 which equates to 2.5 percent that the in a normal year which would be several years ago now um, that's on average what we get from the localities. And so if we take it in, in round numbers, Ms. Ewan, I guess 10 million is about 10% of an increase from the locality. Is that correct? That is. Is that a average round? 10.5 million request for next year would be a 10.3% increase. That Irish math works again. Okay. <laughs> 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 so I. Are there specific questions for Ms. Ewing from board members? This this should all be information known to us. Um, this largely was for the, the public uh, to understand what our thinking was over the next week. So if there are no questions from Ms. Ewing, I would like to ask for a motion and then we can continue to have discussion before we approve it. Is that all good? Thank you, Ms. Ewing. You're welcome. Can I have a motion uh, to approve the 2025 budget? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to amend the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2025 budget as discussed this evening for a total amount of 1 million sorry, $199,646,000, which includes 182,360,000 for the operating fund. Eight <laughs> $8,118,700 for the grants fund, $1,179,800 for the state operating programs fund, and $7,887,500 for the child nutrition services fund, and to authorize Dr. Heron to reduce the operating request to the localities by the additional state revenue that we expect to receive based on the General Assembly's budget. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Is there a second? Second. second. Thank you, Mrs. Henley. And now we, I will um, open the floor for any discussion, if there are any uh, comments that, or questions that board members want to say at this point, and then I will um, summarize at the end what, what we did over the last few weeks. Are there any, any comments that anyone would like to make? Mr. Hosang? Thank you. Um, I've got four separate topics to to discuss regarding the budget. Um, again, we've, the, this board has gone over this budget uh, quite a bit. Um, 
and there's just some issues that I still have some uh, concerns with uh, that, that, in my opinion, we're not getting the full story from either the superintendent or the administration. Uh, the first issue is going to be the this 30 minute SEL training that's going to be required for uh, teachers uh, next year. Uh, we've had multiple requests uh, from teachers, from parents, uh, from myself uh, as to what this uh, is going to entail and we haven't received any firm commitment for, uh, exactly yet what this is uh, going to be about. Uh, the first issue I have with this is why are we wasting half an hour of the school day uh, for these issues when our students right now are failing uh, in SEL uh, testing for the state. Um, we are currently um, going to be doubling the math and English classes next year for the sixth graders uh, because our school system is not, our students are not performing well on those uh, tests. So if we're doubling the time that we're taking for math and English, why are we taking away a half hour of this uh, school week uh, for students to learn um, basically how to be nice to each other. Um, that should be something the parents should be teaching them, not, not the teachers. Um, second, I asked previously what this would cost to our school uh, system to implement this, and I was told it wasn't gonna cost anything. Um, I believe that this is not the full story uh, as to the cost of this, um, which is going to be a common theme in my comments. Uh, teachers will be spending, again, according to what we've been told, 30 minutes to teach uh, these, this subject. Um, so that's 30 minutes per week per teacher for the full school year of them taking time out of their day to teach uh, the SEL training. Um, that doesn't entail um, time for preparation. So I'm going to be easy and just say the teachers are going to take 30 minutes to prepare for this lesson. Um, so that's an hour uh, each week that a teacher is going to be taken away from teaching their students. And again, if you look, if you basically take an hour for a teacher, multiply that by the number of teachers who are going to be teaching this, multiplied by the number of weeks that we have in the school year, that's more than zero. That's a, is a significant amount of money that our school system is paying uh, to teach this for a program that's not even required by the state. The state requires us for the SEL training um, or SEL testing, and we should be focusing our time, our money on that aspect of it and not this SEL training. Third um, issue or third part is Teachers have asked what this training is going to entail, and the last that I've heard is they haven't received anything regarding this training. That may or may not be true. The time when the teachers asked, uh, they were not given anything specific regarding this training. Um, if we're going to be requiring this for our teachers, that should be something that the, the teachers should have uh, before we approve this in, in our budget. The next issue I want to discuss is block scheduling. Uh, we've had multiple teachers talk to us about how this is how they are going to accommodate students um, and and teachers since this will only leave one elective for students to take next year in middle school or at least in the sixth grade. Um, with the doubling up of math classes, English classes, and getting all the other required classes in, it leaves teachers with or at least students, I should say, with one elective. Now, my daughters have gone through, sorry about that, um, the school system, and they were uh, allowed to take multiple electives. And I can say that my daughters received a much better education because they were able to take uh, multiple um, electives. They were able to take multiple art classes um, and choir classes. With the block scheduling that's, that is now being scheduled, our students aren't going to be getting that full education. They're going to be losing that where they can only be taken one uh, elective. Further, we're forcing our teachers um, to deal with larger classrooms to, accom to accommodate uh, the students. So if someone wants to take choir or an art class, that class is going to be bigger because that's going to be the, uh, one of the few electives that those students can take. 
Um, so the teachers are going to be forced to have bigger classrooms. Now, we were told a couple weeks ago or a month ago that that final block may be split into two, uh, but we've heard nothing since. We've heard nothing regarding whether that was going to uh, be split so that students could uh, take two different electives. Um, now, while that would be a great thing for the, uh, for the students to have that opportunity, um, that gives them the multiple, multiple times where they could take a class um, or an elective. But right now, again, like I said, we haven't heard anything where that's going to be something that the students could do. That would also give the teachers an opportunity to teach a smaller class and also an opportunity to have more students in another classroom where they could, uh, the students could take multiple uh, electives. Now, Ms. Hunley and Ms. Chen received an email last week from a middle school teacher asking about additional funding for a fine arts program in middle and high school. With this block scheduling, there will be fewer students taking drama. So fewer students can be available for a production. And sadly, there may be no need for an increase uh, in, the, uh, in the funding for fine arts. And with less middle school students, taking uh, drama uh, in middle school, that's going to leave a void in future years in high school. If they're not going to get that training in middle school, if they're not going to get the love for a, a certain arts class in middle school, they're not going to take it in high school. Well, there's a good chance they're not going to. If we want to keep these students entertained, if we want to keep these students involved in our classrooms, in our schools, this is something we should be fo focusing on and giving them to uh, giving them the best opportunity they can for the best education they can. And finally, we have middle school students at this point in class for over 90 minutes. And in my personal opinion, that's not conducive for children at that age. Um, I've talked to a lot of teachers. I've talked to a lot of parents and they they agree that having a child sit for 90 minutes in a classroom is is not going to be a good thing so keeping that keeping with the current schedule be um, much more cost effective and if we aren't getting information on how we're going to proceed with this then i don't know how we can approve the budget for the next school year regarding employee raises i asked a couple weeks ago a hypothetical about what percentage of a raise would employees receive or teachers receive if the federal government provided us no additional funding, if the state government provided us no additional funding, if our localities provided us no additional funding, and I was told that teachers would receive, receive a 0% raise. That, however, is also incorrect. Because in, in the response, it talked about teachers moving up in years of service. Now, if a teacher moves up from three years of service to four years of service, there is an increase in the salary of that employee, yet the administration refused to admit that. Now, there is some increase in the, in the pay when an employee increases the years of work. And all I asked was that what that increase would be in order so that we, as the board, would have a better understanding and we could uh, notify the teachers of that pay raise. And we were not provided that information, and I think we need to be asked why we're not provided with that, all that information. The final issue is uh, an issue that's come up recently and has been uh, approached um, to the administration is regarding non-English speaking students in our schools. In recent we weeks, there have been an increase in the number of non-English speaking students starting in our schools. The students in our, currently in our schools were not aware of these students coming. The teachers were not aware of these students coming. And because of this, there had been an upheaval in the classrooms that these students are in. Uh, I can, can tell you there's been uh, multiple issues of where the teachers have not been able to teach their class because they've been focusing on these non-English speaking students that were brought into their classrooms unannounced. Um, and that has caused issues regarding our students being taught later on. Um, my daughter's not receiving some education because of the teachers spending most of their time teaching, or trying to communicate, I should say, with these non-English speaking students. 
Now, I submitted school board questions uh, along with some parents as to this issue and have not received a response back from the administration. I would like to know what is being hidden from the parents and the school board. It should be easy to provide information as to why these students are here, who they are, are they legally here, should we as a school district be spending our funds, which are designated for those who are citizens in our city and county, to those who might not be here legally? Also, why are parents and teachers not notified of their arrival? It seems odd that no notification was sent out regarding this. Now, do parents and teachers not have the courtesy of a heads up? Teachers were and still are scrambling to try and communicate with these students since they do not speak English. Now, since someone knew that they were coming, why not at the very least set up a classroom where a teacher who could effectively communicate with these students, teach them, and work with them throughout the day as opposed to putting them into uh, normal classes where they are having a serious effect on the teachers and the students that are in those classrooms. Can I ask a point of order? Um, just in terms of, is there a time limit for a speaker for us in terms of our questions? Because there's been four questions and we usually only do three to five I, 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 I think we closing up, yeah. I think we're wrapping up. We've still got to 10 so minutes. So. I, I'm gonna let this wrap up and then we'll, we'll move on. Well, and to comment on that, I don't believe that any of that's been ever. It's 10 minutes, but right, right, it was 10 minutes. Let's just, let's just close. Well, this is just another way that the, this administration is spending our funds um, without our approval and without uh, advising us of this. I ask again, what else are they spending money on and what are they not telling us about? How can we approve a budget tonight when the people we're relying on for this information is not being forthright with us? Let's not be pressured into passing a budget just to pass it. We've asked for this, and other people have asked for this information repeatedly and have not received anything. If our administrators aren't going to provide this to us, we cannot properly provide or approve the budget. And as a reminder, if there is any type of lawsuit that is filed against the school system, it is us, the school board, who will be liable for any issues, okay. not the superintendent and not the uh, administration. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Hansen. Are there any other comments related to the budget? Uh, Mr. Ripple? Yeah, um, first I'd like to thank Ms. Ewing and her team for dealing with uh, the generous assembly or whatever else you want to call it. these things that are happening. Um, it, this is, like I said, it, it is an unprecedented time in Virginia to release funds coming from the state, um, whether board members agree on that or not. Um, these are raises, these are things that will help our community. Um, but I would like to point out to our local partners, um, there are things that we could be doing more to actually deal with this structure. Um, I look, reviewed the state budgets for and requests from our delegates and senators before arriving today to make this statement. I, I, I don't think the local partners advocated to those, that level of funding. I think if they want to, if you spend money on other parts of your operating budgets for localities, you, you can ask for earmarks in, in that same request. And there was none from our locality partners. And so when we asked for this budget of need, I would like to point to that they didn't do that aspect of their jobs and we're just kind of fulfilling our part of our, our role. Um, I was gonna give us in the joint comment meeting, but I didn't know that was a, a time we could speak to the, everyone there. <laughs> I'm very new to this, but I think it's important that we recognize that here at the school board level that that's not something that they did. Um, I'm sorry for the microphone. It might not be very even helpful to use it anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I would like for us to, yeah, have, when we have a joint meeting or things like that, we actually look into this type of work because their legislative agenda lacked anything that talked about education in ways that could actually help them. They didn't talk about a restriction or restructuring of the LCI. They didn't talk about state education insurance restructuring. They didn't ask for earmarks for schools or any of their grants or programs they've achieved. They only received $1.5 million for a program that's going to Jamestown Island, which is in James City County, but it's not a part of their local budget. It's from the state. So I think there's a way to kind of go about other parts of government using budgetary processes that would help us do our job here at the school board. And that's what I'm asking of them when we do this budget of need. I'm gonna approve it, I'm all for it. I just I wanna point out there's other ways to help 
us alleviate this other cost. Like you could do capital outlay ask, you can do other parts of doing running a school system or running a, a state or local agency. So I know it's kind of weird to be like, oh, I'm voting for the budget and asking our funding partners, but it's like reflect on that part of their job and that, that's what I'm asking here today. It's a little bit important in that aspect. So thank you, Mr. Riffle. If there are any other comments? I, I do have one. Go ahead. Uh, as the board, as we were weighing a potential 5% increase and being thoughtful about what would serve the majority of our teachers and support staff, um, as Ms. Ortego and others mentioned, we spent a lot of time deliberating that and kind of landing on Mrs. Ortego's good idea. <laughs> Effort, team, team but, but you know, of trying to, we want to be responsive to what we heard from a number of the teachers around the importance of the health care and that transition to Sentara feeling a bit quick and not having the opportunity to truly understand what the Sentara plan would provide. And so being able to say that we hear you and that is an important piece of it as well as we also know it's important to have more money in your pocket in terms of that increase. And so that's where and why we landed at the four and a half percent plus staying on the Sentara plan. So thank you, Mrs. Ortego, for that idea. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. But yes, I'll just summarize um, the budget deliberations that the entire board uh, went through over the last two weeks, um, attempting to be truly thoughtful uh, to give the teachers as much as possible um, while being good stewards of, of the money that we're grateful to get from our funding partners and um, also listening to the responses that we did get from teachers and staff over the course of the last month that predominantly in terms of what we received uh, reflected uh, dissatisfaction with, with the healthcare numbers and being potentially priced out of some of the, the current plans. And so we decided we all landed on we had many conversations and there were there was a lot of good exchange and good ideas um, but so what we are changing and and i know that you know dr heron put together her budget based on what she knew at the time which was just the governor's budget and um so she's also she's in support of this plan that we're not doing this um without her you know despite her <laughs> we are doing this now that we have some couple, you know, a little more clarity on what, what the state's going to be able to do. Um, so we are proposing a 4.5% salary increase plus carrying 70% of the 9% uh, health care increase versus the smaller one, um, which is the same, same percentage that we covered of the same plan as last year. Um, and I'd also like to point out that, that already in the budget there were um, – step increases for several um, several positions. So in all in all, um, we are trying to put the funds to the best use possible for as many people as possible and where the need is greatest. That was our thought process. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have landed on this, um, this decision along with, I will mention, um, the re Dr. Kalaza's request to have a full-time bilingual specialist, I think, um, we recognize that that is very necessary. Um, I think Mr. Hosting just pointed that out as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have increased that to a full-time position. So those are the, the three changes, if you will, that the board is proposing um, with, with full agreement and blessing from our superintendent. So hope, I hope that that is clear to the viewing public. Um, and so since we have a motion on the floor, there are no other comments. Ms. Aller, would you please call the roll? Yes, I would. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. No. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Um, sorry, and Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. <clears throat> Mrs. Ortigo, if I could just have a moment, please. Well, of course. I um, just want to really thank Ms. Ewing and her staff and all the senior staff for the incredible amount of information that was brought to the board in a very transparent fashion to present a budget of need to our localities. And uh, I know the board really appreciates all your work as well in getting us thus far and the way in which we've approached it. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. Heron. We, we do thank you for and your team, Ms. Ewing, and, and all the senior staff that contribute to 
you know, just all of our questions. We think it's just a question, and, and for you, that's maybe a whole day of work. So we, we really do appreciate that uh, to help us make the best decision possible. All right, I'll move on to item 8.03, approval of purchase request for security camera upgrades. Can I have a motion? I move to approve the purchase request for security camera upgrades using Optech contract number 21-15019 for a total cost of 245665 Second. Thank you, Ms. Chen and Mr. Riffle. Ms. Aller? Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Mrs. Hosang. Excuse Aye. me, Mr. Hosang. I'm sorry. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. Um, item 8.04, approval of purchase request of laptops for elementary student use. Can I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the purchase request of 752 laptops for elementary student use from Lenovo using the NCPA slash Omnia contract number 01-146 for a total cost of $324,864. Thank you, Mr. Hosang. Is okay. there a second? Mr. Riff, thank you, Mr. Riffle. Mr. Mr. Hosang. Aye. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. And finally, item 8.05, approval of the right-of-way agreement and request for granting of permanent easement at Warhill High School. Can I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the right-of-way agreement and request for granting of a permanent easement at Warhill High School to Virginia Electric and Power Company doing business as Dominion Energy Virginia. Thank you, Mrs. Hunley. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hosang. Ms. Aller, when you're ready. Mrs. Hunley. Aye. Mr. Riffle. Aye. Dr. Cavazos. Aye. Ms. Chen. Aye. Mrs. Donner. Aye. Mr. Hosang. Aye. And Mrs. Ortigo. Aye. All right. That concludes our action items. And we will move on to item nine board member comments we'll start dr cavazos can i start with you yeah i want to take it back to the kids um i want to make the comment that i strongly believe that reading is a fundamental skill of all students and i believe every child in the wjcc school district should be able to read by the third grade and that's not the case today and i think it's the responsibility uh, to, achieve, to achieve this goal should be shared by all the teachers, all the administrators, administrators and above all, um, the parents themselves. And I was really delighted to see these young kids at Laurel Lane um, teach their younger sibling or their younger students uh, in that school. I, I thought that was really excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cavazos. Ms. Chen, you had a comment? Um, I just wanted to mention um, that I really enjoyed um, some school visits uh, since we last met. So um, Berkeley Middle School um, showed us their amazing care closet and how they're providing for all of their students' needs. Um, at Jamestown High School and Lafayette High School, um, they did mention that, that we do have an influx as a sort of national issues, um, an influx of, of non-English speaking students and they have embraced those students and um, we, we heard firsthand about how our students are doing well, all of them. Um, and I will say my own, my own children as well um, have talked about how they've had new classmates that come from different countries and have different cultures and speak different languages and they've been welcomed by the teachers and there have not been any disruptions in the classroom. So I just thought that I would point that out um, from personal experience as well as as a school board member visiting many of the schools and hearing firsthand. Um, so I just want to say thank you to our students for their care, um, for their commitment, and to our teachers as well. Thank you, Ms. Chen. Uh, Mr. Riffle, over to you. Okay. Um, well, I, I like Ms. Chen. I also went to some schools. Actually, actually only with Ms. Chen. I did almost everything I did as a school member since we last met with, with Ms. Chen. So uh, we would 
It's been fun. Um, we went to the Williamsburg, um, the special ed department and SIAC um, event this past weekend. That was cool. They had like little tiny little petting zoo and trains and you know, it seemed like it was a great time for, for families to, to come and enjoy the space at Lafayette High School. Um, and I, I think it was really a great event. And I'd love to see more community partners come and embrace our students in that. Um, you know, there's some empty tables there. It'd be great to keep seeing that event grow more and more each year. Um, and then I enjoyed my school visits. That's really cool to kind of talk to principals and see students like in the hallways and then, you know, and enjoy listening to bands and seeing facilities like the new tennis courts at Lafayette High School, which don't have lights, which is something I learned um, that that's controlled by the school system and not by a local gov. So I'm interested to see how that partnership can be developed so that the public can use things that they purchase for things like that. So um, it's important for us to visit these facilities to hear from their staff and to, to come and enjoy kind of what students see every day and see some of the challenges that they're facing. So I appreciate Dr. Herring and, 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 and Ms. Aller for helping us schedule those things. And I look forward to my um, board meeting tomorrow with WHRO, which will be fun. So, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Riffle. Mr. Hersang, any final comments? Yes. I uh, just want to thank Dr. Swan from Laurel Lane for coming and with her presentation. Uh, it was great seeing everything that they're doing there. <clears throat> And being uh, uh, retired military, I'm hoping that uh, we as a school board can do something regarding the attendance policy for at least the military uh, personnel or military uh, mm -hmm. students of their children of military personnel, who especially if they're going to be deployed, where we can, if you want to say, make an exception for them to have some extra days to uh, be away from the school so that they can be with their parent before they're deployed. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hosang. Mrs. Hunley? Yes. Um, also, um, I attended some s school visits. So, uh, Mr. Riffle and I went to James River, oh, yeah. and Sorry. they are no, I no. I did the same thing. I forgot <laughs> Miss Ortego I last so week. Many, you know? <laughs> but um, they're getting ready for Dolphin March Madness, just like we're getting ready for March Madness for basketball. So their staff is going to play the fire department. They have jerseys, they have cheerleaders, and it's um, Friday at 5 o'clock if you can make it. That's going to be so much fun. Um, and Mr. Riffle um, gifted the fourth and fifth grade um, students with Virginia and um, USA cute little stands for their flags So from his, his job. So that was very appreciative. Um, then I went with Ms. Chen also to, to Berkeley. and. Um, I do believe recess is very important and I want to thank their administrative staff because they allow their children to, um, after lunch, go out and burn some energy. And uh, they supervise that though, so <laughs> it's a little different, but it, it, it has benefited the children as they come back in. Also um, went with Mr. Hossein to um, Stonehouse, my old stomping grounds, and uh, we met an awesome, uh, it's SRO, Mr. Hill, and uh, he has this office with all kinds of little superhero gadgets in there. And so um, it's just great to see the relationships that our um, SROs have with our students. And also, they're keeping the school safe, and, and it's a, it goes hand in hand. And then Mr. Jose and, and I also went to Norwich Elementary School, and um, we got to look at the... Uh, the back part where the new preschool, when we break ground on that, it's going to be the new preschool. And, and um, we looked at some of the logistics of the, uh, I hate to say the parent pickup line, because that's a bad word now, but parent pickup line. So um, that was interesting, too, to just physically put my eyes on it instead of looking at a, you know, a grid um, with our other presentations. And then, um, and Mr. Riffle, don't feel bad, I did forget that. I went with Miss Ortigo to um, Hornsby Middle School, and that's my husband's school, and I went right in his room, and I forgot to even report on it. <laughs> but um, one thing I liked about um, last year, the, all the staff did what's important to them, their why, and they wrote it up. But this time, they were able to um, make a bracelet. They got into Swifty, if you all know Taylor Swift and her little bracelets. So they made a bracelet with their why, and then they also made a bracelet for their for another colleague. So um, I thought that was just a great um, thing to do to start the year off. 
um, and they had their play Into the Woods. So as you know, um, I missed Berkeley's The Adams Family. I heard it was very good. But um, Hornsby did Into the Woods. And it was just, it's refreshing for me, as some of you may know, I did teach here in this division for 26 years, kindergarten. But to see these students now in middle school and high school, it, it just blows my mind the wonderful things that they do artistically, musically, fine arts, academically, and in, in, in the athletics. And um, I'm super proud to say that I am a product that I got to teach here. And um, for our staff, I did read the survey uh, today. And um, thank you. I know how hard that is to share, to come forward, but to share it, your stories in writing um, was, was just very humbling for me to see. And, and um, I am looking forward to finding out where we are in the process of um, what we're getting ready to do as far as uh, collective bargaining, just wondering where we are in the process. And um, the one thing I want to say is, not I don't believe in luck, but to say that we're lucky that the, that the teachers love to be here, it's a blessing that they want to stay here and work here. And so um, whatever um, we can do to support that is what this board is invested in. And um, because we do see you, we know how hard you work, and you are re our students' best hope. And so we want you to stay, and we're working on it. Just be patient. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hunley. Mrs. Donner? Thank you. Um, one of the things that we try to teach our children is about integrity and values. And so for me to live in my integrity and my values, I can't sit on the dais and not address something that was said that is a racist trope about people who are coming from other countries and who speak other languages. And so I just want to be very clear that each of us as board members, we have our own points of view, we have our own um, perspectives, and we have this floor and this dais and this platform to share those. And so as my colleagues have the opportunity to share what their views are, I'm going to take that opportunity at this moment. And I just want to be very clear that saying that someone who is coming to this, who is coming to our schools and because they are Spanish speaking, that they are an illegal and that parents should be warned about their presence in our schools is racist. It is nothing other than racist. And that is not something that I, that point of view does not represent my point of view as a school board member and I want it to be very clear that that is not a position that I have ever heard us take as Williamsburg James City County. We are here to educate children, all children. Their immigration status, their parents' immigration status, that is not what we are here for. We are here for education. And there's a lot of conversation around the point of this flag that's behind us right, bring us your tired, your weary, all of those that people want to put forward when it is in maybe towards a certain group of people, a certain type of people, what they look like, what they speak like. But if we are truly to believe what is the promise of America, it is all people. And whether they are coming here because they are fleeing things that are happening in their country, they are someone who has a skill set that we need in the US and they are coming here to be able to to provide those skills for us in the US because they're, it doesn't matter why they are here, they are all here because they want a better life. And that is what we all have as human beings is that we all want the same things. We want a better life for our children, we want a better life for ourselves, we want to be safe, we want to love our families, we want to be together with our families. And so I just want to be very clear that for me, and from what I understand, our school di division, we are not focused on your immigration status. If you have a child who is sitting in Williamsburg in James City County and who is of school age, register them. We are here to care for all of the children and to provide for their education. That is my comment. Thank you, Mrs. Donner. Um, in closing, I want to bring our focus back to um, our main purpose here tonight, we, we did uh, approve a budget and we worked 
actually very well together to do that. Um, I want to thank my board colleagues for all of the time um, and conversations and ideas that were offered. Um, as a board, we are here to support the entire school division and to make the best decisions possible for all children, all staff, and it is, it is okay to have different opinions and we have times and places to express them respectfully and then we come together as one board and continue to work on behalf of Lindsburg James City County students and teachers and staff. And so I just want to say that in closing that that that's what our focus will remain uh, moving forward. And um, so just want to thank everyone for the work that, that you all did, all the senior staff to get us to this point tonight. And um, I think I will leave it at that. I hope you all have a very good evening. And I will um, move on to just announce some upcoming events. The policy committee will be meeting tomorrow morning, um, March 20th at 8.30 a.m. in room 203, the school board and central office. Uh, the Career Ready Advisory Committee will meet on March 27th at 3.30 p.m. in room 300 of the Annex. Um, the Special Education Advisory Committee will meet next on April 11th at 6.30 p.m. in room 300 of the Annex. And our upcoming meetings, come on. Uh, our next closed session will be on um, April 9th starting at 4 p.m. in room 300 followed by our work session and action items also April 9th at 4.30 p.m. in room 300 of the Annex. After that, the next closed session will be on April 16th at 5.45 p.m. in room 300 of the Annex, um, followed by our regular meeting, again, here in James Blair Middle School Gymnasium. That's um, April 16th at 6.30 p.m. And with that, this meeting is adjourned.